we'll be talking about benign cutaneous lesions of surgical importance. Um, and uh, there's, there's very little that you need to, to actually know in terms of uh, the, how they come about and all those things, yeah? So why do we say that they are of surgical importance? One, it's because it could be pre-malignant. So it could be a precursor to a cancer. Uh, it's causing discomfort to the patient. So they say some pressure, maybe the, the swelling is causing pressure and making the patient un dis uh, uncomfortable. It could be disfiguring. So there's some lesions that you'll see that are very uh, disfiguring. Uh, they change the appearance of someone. And then there's some which even interfere with function, your, your ability to move your hands, your thighs and all that stuff. Uh, and again, one of the most important reasons for at least the, 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 the plastic surgeons is cosmesis, okay. Um, sorry. So uh, we have, we just need to remind ourselves of the, uh, of the, the way we can describe um, cutaneous lesions. And this is basic uh, dermatology. I think you guys will have done this multiple times. We will discuss most of these things. Some of them will not uh, go in details, but uh, I will have one slide which summarizes all these things. And then uh, for sure, and I will just tackle this objective now, there is more to this lecture than what I've presented to you guys. Um, so that opens doors for you to go and read more and find out more about it. Um, but yeah, so I'll start by asking a few questions here. Again, we, we, let's try and answer as quickly as possible so that we can, uh, we can also move and do other things. Um, so yeah, let me start with uh, Maria Odiambo. Is she with us here? Maria Odiambo, what is number one? This one? Num that's a blister. Okay, so, so. so what's a blister? How do you define a blister? Uh, I think it's a fluid filled elevation of the epidermis. Yes, yes. So it's a non specific term for fluid filled uh, lesions. If it's less than 0 0.5 centimeters or 5 millimeters, it's a vesicle. If it's more than 5 millimeters, it's a uh, bullet. And that's when we saw in uh, necrotizing fasciitis where you have a lot of bullet. Okay, uh, the next person is um, class rep. Tell us what, what is this that you're seeing here? These lesions, Vincent? What do you think these are? Is Vincent with us? Yes. Uh... I think it's hyperpigmentation, so I'm not very sure. Sorry, you said it off? Um, it's, I just can see uh, some multiple hyperpigmented lesions, but I'm not very sure exactly the name. Okay, so, so this is a loss of epidermis, which is now called an erosion. It can happen uh, with so many things, friction, can happen with some, some lesions, we'll talk about them. This one is, a, is caused by a scratch or a linear cut or something, of something, and it's called uh, excoriation, okay. What about this one? This one is very common and you see it in the words. Uh, Veronica Como, what is this? I'm sure you... Mm -hmm. What is it? I don't know what's happening. Is yes. Mm 
This one is called lynchenification, and it's caused by the many things that could cause it. Uh, it's, it's caused by thickening of the skin, so it becomes like this. I'm sure you've heard that word before. Um, what about the next one? Um, let me see who's, who's, who else is in the group. Um, Joseph Kisavuli, what, what is this? What are these patch E looking up here and what are they? Hello? I can't see a slide. Can you see now? What is this? I'm seeing someone in the chat has already answered. That's a macio. So it's a, it's a flat lesion, uh, usually less than 0 0.5 centimeters in size. Um, what is this one? Maybe you can answer now, Joseph. I think this is the easiest part of this lecture, and then we are, we are cruising after uh, that. Good evening, Doc. And uh, we cannot see your casa. Yeah, this one, the black, this one. Are you able to see? The bottom left. On the left side of uh, Morgan Freeman, this one. What is that? Anyone want to attempt? Is that a mole? Uh, okay. What's a what's a better way of seeing it? A melanocytic nevus? Uh, no, not really. Very simple way of calling it. Such an N. Let me see whether someone has said in the nodule, yes. A nodule, so yeah. This is a nodule, yeah. Uh, it's an elevated uh, solid lesion, usually over 0 0.5 centimeters. Uh, and then the next one, this one's for Morgan Freeman. What do you think they are? They have a similar description to a nodule, but they're less than 0 0.5 centimeter. Papule. This papule, I'm seeing guys are saying papule. Uh -huh. Guys are saying plaque. Uh -huh. It's a plaque, eh? Sorry, sorry, yeah, it's a papule, sorry. So uh, 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 the, a plaque usually is, is elevated, but has like a flat, uh, it has a flat top, so it has like a plateau, and it's more or less similar to what a nodule is. But this one, you can see that it's rounded off. Usually, it's usually flat. Um, so you also have pustules, which are fat filled, uh, sorry, the pus filled. Um, and then you have what we see over here. Does anyone want to give us a guess what this is? Something you'll see a lot. Especially on the scalp. And there's a reason why on the scalp we see it a lot. What is this? Sorry? Is that scaling? Uh-huh. What do you Looks what like capitis or something. Uh -huh. So it has a lot of sebum, this one. A lot of sebum being released. Seborrheic dermatitis. Yes. So this is seborrheic. Uh, that's what's happening here. Usually you have a lot of sebaceous glands on the sc scalp and the nose. 
So sometimes it tend to have this type of appearance in those areas. Okay. That's uh, basically it. Oh, this one is called uh, sessile. Uh, usually, uh, it's usually, it has like a very broad base and it's attached to the skin. Okay. Um, it's not pedun uh, pedunculated. So if, if you see something like this, just know that it's more or less a sessile. And it's usually very, very big. Okay. Um, so the general statement, and this is what I was telling, um, Vincent, today's lecture is, I can finish it very quickly if you, if you answer questions. This is the main, the main slide. If you get nothing from this class, this is what you need to take home. Uh, the benign lesions are usually symptomatic, uh, benign lesions that are usually symptomatic or cosmetically bothersome can be managed by simple procedures such as cryotherapy, electrosurgery, and excision. Okay. So cryotherapy, what we are doing is we are, uh, we are basically reducing the temperature of that lesion up to the point where we kill the cells, okay? So the freezing point for most, for the, the, the cytol, the cell, for the cell itself, usually around negative 15. And, and uh, the, the temperature that this, this thing usually has can go up to negative uh, 200 degrees Celsius. So with that, we kill the cells. Uh, usually you direct it on the lesion. You, you uh, what do you call this? It freezes it, you create like an ice, and then you, you thaw out polypol. You don't usually pull out the machine, uh, and then it will remove the lesion. It's good for small lesions, and not so good for very, very huge lesions. Um, but, uh, the unfortunate thing is that area sometimes tends to get post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, uh, especially us individuals uh, who have dark skin, okay? Uh, there are many other side effects, in, including even edema. Sometimes you can even get uh, edema, which causes uh, difficulty breathing and issues like that. So when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're doing cryotherapy, which hopefully you might be able to do at some point, um, you need to be aware of the, the advantages and disadvantages. So as I was saying, negative 15 is for freezing of the cellular space. Uh, and then usually the machine can go up to negative 200. But for malignant cells, which is not what we're doing today, we can actually freeze them at negative 50, okay? Um, so some of the advantages that you might want to know is that there's very little hemorrhage with uh, cryotherapy. Usually they don't have a lot of pain, uh, very minimal scarring, uh, and it's very good for hemangiomas, which is the opposite of lymphangiomas. Uh, they tend not to be that good, effective in lymphangiomas. Um, and then, so the biggest disadvantage which I wanted you to know is this post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. Sometimes it can cause edema and swelling of the airways. Uh, it's not effective against lymphangiomas, and um, sometimes you might not be able to remove the whole tumor altogether. Okay, uh, electro surgery is something maybe you guys will see. I don't know whether you guys go to, to theater, but this is something that you, you would benefit by seeing as they do the electrocautery to remove the tissues. And then the usual sharp, um, the shavings, and then there's uh, uh, excisions, okay? That's basically how we tend to, to treat them. You cut and then you just switch up by primary closure. Or uh, again, if you're seeing that the lesion is getting bigger at a very uh, accelerating uh, uh, a pace and also it's changing in color, then you need to be now worried. It's not benign anymore, it's becoming malignant. So it's more of biopsy. Uh, and when you're biopsying, you're trying to make a diagnosis of a malignancy. All right. So, so, so we'll start with the dummies and then we'll go the epidermis. Quickly, we'll just go through them. All right. So for the for the dummies, you have uh, dermatofibroma, neurofibromas, and skin tags. Uh, so this is how dermatofibromas tend to appear. Uh, so it looks more like a nodular appearance, okay? 
uh, and there are benign lesions coming from histi uh, histiocytes, which are those uh, inflammatory cells found in skin. Uh, why it occurs is unknown, but sometimes it occurs after trauma or insect bites. And then if you have multiple of them, we start getting worried you might be immunosuppressed, okay, for whatever reason. Okay, so there are many variants that uh, would be good to know because they tend to recur and sometimes become now uh, cancerous and then metastasize. So it's good to know, but uh, I doubt someone is going to start disturbing me about them. Okay. Um, and then skin tags. So you can see that it's pedunculated, right? And then it grows like a tree, all right? So, oh, so they appear as pedunculated uh, lesions with a narrow stalk, okay? So they're associated with the metabolic syndrome and diabetes, actually. This is the more way you tend to see them. In obese people, you remember that in obese people, they tend to have this uh, darker thighs, uh, thigh rubs and all that. So that predisposes them to getting these things, all right? So metabolic syndrome and then diabetes. You can also get it in Crohn's, which is not very common in our setup. And then the beats uh, Dubé syndrome. Okay, so as I've said, you tend to find them in areas of friction. Um, uh, so if they, if they have in the armpit, the neck, uh, if they have gigantomastia, uh, this unfortunately tend to appear. So they can become traumatized and sometimes even necrotized and become infected, as I was saying, and it causes a lot of pain, right? Remember torsion, um, I'm sure you guys, I don't know whether you have someone who's giving you urology tutorials, but uh, torsion is something that you need to know for gen surge. Uh, sorry, for urology. Uh, remember the general statement that I said about uh, management? Here it holds true everything that I said. If anyone asks you how to manage them, it's basically what I said in the previous slide. Uh, they're very unlikely to recover after removal. Okay, but new ones can appear because again, if you don't sort out the metabolic syndrome or the diabetes or these other chronic issues, they tend to recur. Okay, uh, this is a neurofibroma. So there are benign lesions from uh, nerve sheets. Uh, they, they can come from mast cells, neuro, perineural cells, Schwann uh, cells, and fibroblasts. All right. So they tend to appear like this nodular. They don't turn, they usually have a similar color, but you can see some small capillaries on them. Um, most of the time they occur sporadically, uh, but sometimes they can be associated with other other diseases, right? Uh, so the disease that we are more concerned by is neurofibromatosis, okay? And there's type one and type two, and then there's schwannomatosis, okay? Um, so this one is the gene, the uh, NF1 gene, which is associated with that a particular disease. And the hallmark usually is the multiple cafe ole, Macules, so the flat macules um, that you see over here. All right, so it's cafe au lait, I think it means coffee or milk. I'm forgetting my French, but it appears to be like something of the sort. So these this small, small macules, you'll find them with that. All right. Um, so the uh, N, N1 gene, sorry, the NF1 gene is associated with um, some tumors because it tends, when, when it starts, when you have some um, variations out of the normal for that gene, it tends to produce a lot of, um, uh, what do you call this, RAS. So the downstream molecular pathway tends to create a lot of RAS, which in turn is a, a what do you call this, is an oncogene. So the cells replicate a lot, and then you have this growth that are appearing, okay. So what I want you to remember from this slide is neurofibroma is associated with neurofibromatosis, okay, type 1 and type 2, and also schwannomatosis, okay. Remember an NF1 gene. Uh, remember also the cafe au lait if you, if you find it again. And the last thing that I want you to remember is this button uh, hole sign. So if you compress this lesion, sorry, if you compress this lesion, then you have this like button hole appearance, okay. So direct pressure 
to some uh, neurofibromas, might, might cause them to retract into the skin, a finding that has been described as button hold sign. Uh, so for the data, for the, this is supposed to be, sorry, this is supposed to be the epidermis, I'll change that. Uh, so you have, you have uh, seborrheic keratosis, and then you have dermatosis papulosa negra. Today's class, me, I'm talking a lot, by the way, <laughs> because I, I'm assuming most of these things are either foreign or new information. Uh, but anyone can stop me if I'm going too fast. Okay. So the first one is this one. And uh, the usually common epidermal tumors uh, due to proliferation of immature keratinocytes. They appear, they affect young adults. And why they appear, no one knows. All right. But what I wanted to remember is, and that's why I've put this image for you, is stick-ons. I'm sure there's some ladies who have this in the class or... I don't know, but anyway, so these are stick-ons. So what I want you to remember is that they appear stuck on, like if, if you look at this one, it looks like it's stuck on this guy's head, all right? So usually they're well, uh, well circumscribed lesions, which tend to scale at the top, uh, but they appear as if they were stuck on the skin. They appear like they're not even attached, all right? So remember that. Another thing that I want you to remember about that disease, is uh, this uh, Christmas tree appearance. Okay. As you can see this, like this is the trunk, the spine. Is it the trunk or the, I don't know what they call it. Is it the trunk? I'm not so sure. But this is the middle part of the tree. I think it's the trunk. And then now these are the branches. Okay. So why is a coil Christmas? Uh, is because of these decorations uh, we tend to put on a Christmas tree. Uh, so that's the same thing that you're seeing all these spots, is, uh, those decor decorations we put. Okay, so they tend to be distributed about, are, along Langer's lines, so li lines of maximum flexion. Um, and th there's a very important term that I want you to remember is that when you see this, or if your patient comes and tells you that this just appeared all of a sudden and they've been growing uh, at a very rapid rate, then you should be, you should now, you know, what do you call this? Your bulge should now start firing, right? Because it is an abrupt appearance of uh, seborrheic keratosis, which are increasing in number and size, then uh, you should now be worried that someone could be having lung cancer or some form of JT cancer, all right? Um, remember JT starts from all the way from the top, who could, uh, the oral cavity coming downwards, uh, pharynx, esophagus, stomach, uh, intestines, and then finally we have your anus and then out. So all that is, is something you need to be worried about. And that what we, we say it's the tesia te, te let me just tell you how to spell it. It's L-E-S-E-R-T-R-E-L-A-T. -E -E okay. Because uh, my French is not that good. Right, so that's that's what this that sign is. When it appears abruptly, and you have multiple of them, and they're increasing in number and size, you should be worried about lung and GAT cancers. Okay, again, you have pseudo laser te, te lat sign, whereby um, they appear in a similar way, but in this case. Uh, you've given the patient chemotherapy for whatever reason, okay? So, so they already had seborrheic keratosis before, and then you gave them a chemotherapy. Um, so you can check out the two of them, one starts the C, another one starts the D, but it's in the, in the notes in the slides. So when you give those people chemotherapy, then they tend to have a rapid uh, appearance and growth. Of these lesions. Okay. Uh, these are the variants that you have. Number one is the most important that I want you to remember dermatosis, papillosa, nigra. You have uh, stucokeratosis, large cell uh, anchantoma, and colonial and irritated uh, seborrheic keratosis. Right. Uh, but number one, don't forget. Um, 
So number one is this one with Morgan Freeman who has this uh, uh, papules on his face, okay? So usually there are multiple, as you can see, and they're usually dis distributed in a, tend to be like a cosmetic appearance. If you check most of them, for him, I think it adds to the cosmesis of his face. Um, and uh, what do you call this? There's a genetic predisposition. Uh, and then they tend to have a symmetrical distribution on the face or sometimes on the neck and the trunk. Okay. Um, the reason we, this is uh, one of the unique things now I wanted you to know about such diseases that cryotherapy is not used in such patients. Okay. Um, and the reason is because of that post-inflammatory hypopigmentation, as we, as we mentioned before. But other treatments are possible. But you can imagine trying to remove all this by excision. You'll stay there for for a whole, probably three hours, just trying to remove each one of them. Okay, so majority of the patients don't seek treatment, as I was saying, because if it's symmetrical, it adds to the, uh, to the character of someone's face. Uh, I'm sure you guys can never forget this guy's face because of that. Um, but you can do light electro dissection at low power um, to try and, and remove this. Okay, but remember that what I said, general statement, everything is there other than the cryotherapy. For uh, stuco keratosis, usually around the feet, this image is not that clear, but this is someone's feet. Okay, uh, you have this uh, harmless numerous papules, which are work-like, and they tend to appear in, in aging skin. So it appears as if the skin is very really dry. Okay, uh, that's why it's called a sessile, senile what? most of the time, or a wisdom what, okay. You have this one, which is a large cell uh, acanthoma. Sorry. Yes, so you tend to have these macules uh, on a photodamaged cell uh, skin, All right. Epidermal, uh, ependymal uh, tumors. Um, if one of you can tell me what are the uh, appendages you expect, uh, Michelle, which which uh, appendage do we expect on skin? Michelle is with us today. Uh, hair. Mm -hmm. So hair follicles. Hair follicles and sebaceous glands. Okay. All right. So the, uh, when I put this and I asked arise from where, it's everything that you find attached to the skin. So even nails, you can have tumors that are coming from the nail beds and all that stuff. All right. So the, all the appendages, hair follicles, sebaceous glands, um, sweat glands, all right. All these are sources of tumors. Um, I, I don't know, Michelle, do you know what, how do you call a benign tumor of sweat gland? I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'm sure you, you'll check it out. Um, but we, but in all of them, there's so many. Like that's what I'm saying. Like the appendageal tumors are, are so many. They arise from all the structures within the the dermis that are being housed, right? And sometimes it's it's hard for you to know. Like even if I was to point at this one, you just tell me that this is a nodular lesion. You wouldn't know where it's arising from. Okay. Uh, this is another important one, a cyst, uh, which is a fluid-filled sac, uh, sometimes semi-solid, uh, sometimes just liquid. Um, uh, what do you call this? So when you're removing it, the main concept when you're trying to remove them is that you remove the contents of the cyst plus the cyst sac, so the epithelial lining. All right. 
Some people uh, inject the cyst with uh, steroid injections to prevent infection and uh, need for you to even excise them. But uh, wherever you guys will go for internship, uh, especially in a public hospital, this is something that you, you'll tend to do a lot in minor theater, okay? Uh, so you, you will have to, to learn how to do this practically. I don't know whether anyone has ever removed, has anyone ever removed a cyst in the class and wants to tell us how they went about it? No one has removed a cyst. Okay. So, so what you see is that the main concept is this injection of uh, local anesthetics. Usually, most of the time, it's 2% uh, lidocaine with uh, adrenaline to, to stop bleeding, especially if it's an area which can bleed a lot. Uh, you infiltrate. Uh, I'm sure these are things that you learn during your surgical skills. I don't know whether that's what you trained, but you will be shown how to infiltrate areas that you're trying to excise wounds, and all that stuff, okay. So infiltrate the area all around the cyst, okay. You do this elliptical incision, okay. So you tend to go above and beyond the wound. Sorry, not the wound, the cyst. And then you, you try your best to remove it once. Sometimes it's very hard for you to remove without removing the contents first, but so you, can, you can sometimes remove all of it all at once, okay. And when you remove, do a nice suturing, which I'm, I'm sure you guys are being shown in the surgical skills lab. Suture nicely and let the patient go home. They don't need to stay in the hospital. Okay, not unless they have multiple cysts, which now you need to investigate further why they have all those cysts. Okay, but this is something, uh, if you don't have a chance to do, I'm sure you can try even in Kenyatta, go to the minor theater. I'm sure you'll find, one day you'll find a cyst to remove. All right, uh, and the technique is very similar to very small uh, lesions, um, even lipomas, okay. Uh, vascular ones, we have uh, pyogenic uh, uh, granuloma, and then you have cherry angiomas. So for, for these uh, pyogenic granulomas, they tend to have this, uh, what did you call it? This plateau-like, flat surface, all right. Uh, and then this uh, multicolored, but tends to have this red appearance, but it's not homogeneous, okay? They, they grow very quickly, but they're very friable, so they can easily be destroyed you start, um, it starts bleeding on you, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so, so the pyogenic, they have that black appearance, which is heterogeneous in color. Okay. And then you have the cherry, which has a cherry appearance, the red, uh, I think red maroon spectrum. Um, they tend to affect mostly middle age and older individuals. And sorry, and they have this dome shaped appearance. Okay. When you compress them, they don't blanch. So the cherryness never goes away, okay? So for lipomas, um, lipomas are superficial benign tumors arising from mature fat cells, and then they have this fibrous capsule. Uh, most of the time, you will need to do an ultrasound, okay? If, if it's big enough, I would highly recommend that you do an ultrasound, okay? Do an ultrasound, find out what it is. Sometimes it could be an epidymoid uh, cyst or a ganglion cyst, and you've, you've, you've just assumed that it's a lipoma. So when you open it up, it starts uh, leaking out contents, okay? And you might not be ready for that. Uh, sorry. If, uh, if suspected, if, sus if uh, suspected lipoma causes symptoms, then it should be quickly removed, okay? Uh, so you do a biopsy and find out why is it rapidly growing and then you, you what do you call this, now excited. So part of the management, other than the, the other things that I mentioned at the beginning, the general statement, you have liposuction, then you have this video that we can quickly check out. 
So this, this video is a lady who has uh, multiple lipomas. So I just wanted to quickly share with you. Let me see whether we can. Are you able to see the YouTube Ooh, somebody's page? Somebody's bumps up. Are you guys able to see the YouTube page? Yeah, we are. Okay, no, sorry. yes. Out of one slit in the skin, that would be wonderful. Can you look down a little bit? Can you see that? Can you see that? Uh huh. There it goes. Oh my goodness. Oh, look. Did you see that? That's a cute little double, a little booty. <laughs> that was like a twerk. <laughs> Usually I do maybe one, two, or even three lipomas per patient, but there's no telling how many lipomas are actually under there. I hope you guys have seen that technique. Um, again, you remember the elliptical? So for her, she's not done elliptical, she's just done a linear incision uh, across the, the surface. And then she's just popping them out. I think that's why she's called uh, Dr. Pimple popper, but like she pulls just underneath and pulls it out. Sometimes what you might have to do is what she just did here with the curved scissors. You might not need to go underneath the skin and try and, and loosen the fibrous capsule and then pop it out. Okay. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to share with you guys there. Let me see whether we can stop sharing. And then back to the presentation. So I've put the link in the I put the link in the in the in this PPT. So you can watch the full video of how of how she goes about it. All right. This is something again, as I'm saying, if you go to a public hospital, especially farther from Nairobi, these are things that you will have, or you not even be forced, you might have to do them because they, they might not have those funds for uh, coming to Nairobi to have a lipoma removed. Okay, so try and learn this uh, surgical skills. Funny enough, for me, I was taught how to remove a lipoma by a clinical officer. So I'm sure some of you should be challenged to, to learn how to remove them. If clinical officers can remove them, even you, you can learn how to, to remove them. Because you might, you might go to a center where they don't, the people that you're dealing with don't have the patience or the finances to travel far to have these things removed. Okay. Um, the questions and then you're done. Let me let me share the questions. So Hassan can quickly answer the question. Then we are done for the day.
Maybe a few more can answer, then I can we can move to the next one. Anyone brave enough to tell us why they chose uh, X-ray? Anyone can answer? I chose chest x-ray because it was rapidly developing. This looks like seborrheic keratosis. Uh -huh. uh, and we mentioned that if it's rapidly developing, it could be a GIT or lung cancer. So we need to investigate. Uh -huh. So why not alpha fetoproteins? The alpha fetoproteins are uh, GIT markers. Were they for solid? It's mostly a marker for hepatocellular carcinoma, and it's not the first line. Uh, what's the first line? I didn't know that. What's the first line? But I go check out. <laughs> but I go check. That's I think you've been thinking uh, <laughs> the was maybe you try CEA. Uh, but even that, I don't think would be my first line. Okay, so, so. I'll go check up as well. So yes, it's a it's a chest uh, chest chest X-ray for that one. Uh, the last one, uh, which one of the following is false? So to answer Albert. Uh, and Albert will tell us what you write as your answer for this one. I'm seeing you've asked us, how do we distinguish clinically between a lipoma, a epidermoid cyst, and a ganglion cyst? Um, history, physical exam, number one. So in your history, um, okay, the ultrasound is a good option, but it's not the only option. You can actually detect them by physical exam. So like a lipoma tends to be rubbery when, you, when you're palpating them. Okay, an epidermoid cyst tend to have this hard texture, like that of, a, of, a, on a, of an abscess. And that's why sometimes it's always good to aspirate first. Okay, especially if you're not thinking it's a malignant uh, lesion, you can aspirate. A ganglion cyst has this jelly-like, uh, like uh, balloon-like feel that is filled in like water, okay? But not really like water, water, but like you can feel it's like jelly moving. Again, where do you find ganglion cysts? They tend to be around joints. So at the wrist of the hand, uh, or the dorsum of the, of the hand, or at the wrist on the, on the volar surface. And so you tend to find them, okay? Uh, epidermoid cysts uh, can occur anywhere, but, also, uh, around the neck is where you'd expect them because uh, they have that, uh, that local. The problem you can find them in most areas of the body, especially where there's fat. Uh, but that texture, when you touch them, is, 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 can help you distinguish even before. Aspirating can, sometimes can be good. But I wouldn't tell you to aspirate a ganglion cyst. Sometimes we just aspirate before we do the surgery just to reduce the size because you don't want to, to create a mess, especially in, a, in, out, in an outpatient setup, right? Uh, again, the epidermal cysts, when you're removing them, the fluid that is coming from them, the ganglion cysts will have this serous like fluid, epidermal cysts will have this cheesy appearing fluid, and then a lipoma will be a solid uh, rubbery mass that is coming out. Uh, Mohammed Amin, how do we treat epidermoid cysts? I've I've just I've talked about them. I, I, there's a general statement that I that I gave at the beginning. And then I also gave you a, a what do you call this? I, sh I showed you a a picture of how to remove them. 
So maybe you can, you can review that slide. Yeah. Okay, uh, what is false? Cosmetic bothersome can be treated with excision. Uh, do not enter, okay, put, okay, fine. Albert, why, why, did, why did you choose C? Chibulukot? Why did you choose C? I'm seeing everyone has chosen C. Because, because, uh, because it, it's false. So, cryotherapy uh, cannot be used in dermatosis population. <laughs> I don't hear you. Uh, but I'm sure you gave the right answer. Um, <laughs> I can't hear you very well, Dr. Uh, maybe Melvin Kitololo is somewhere silent. Melvin, are you somewhere silent? I keep I keep choosing the same same names. I need to change my let me see who's outside this class. I think he said something along the lines of um DPN is difficult to remove with cryotherapy. Ah, no, not really difficult. It's more of we don't want the hypopigmentation, the post-inflammatory pigment, hypopigmentation. That was my main worry. Okay. So yeah, with that, guys, I am done. Uh, if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Class rep, am I allowed to leave? Am I there is someone who has something burning that I've not clarified? Vincent. Hello, Vincent, can I tissue? I think you're allowed, but <laughs> I think I can leave you guys. Eh? So there's no question. Uh, thank you for listening to me. I think next week now we start the the last part of our of our series, which is uh, malignant tumors, we have uh, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, basal cell carcinoma, and um, malignant melanoma together with Kaposi sarcoma. I don't know whether they're supposed to be given each their own class, but I could put some of I could put them together and make it easier for you guys and also create time for you to, to read for your exams because uh, you may need time on your own to just read before your exams. Are you guys doing exams in two weeks? When are you doing your exams? That's um, the second week of April. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so I'll try and compress them. Uh, if possible, we finish next week. If we can't, we can do the next two weeks and then that's it for me in terms of my tutorials. If there's anything else you might want, but otherwise have a good evening. Enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye. You too. Bye, thank you.